46. The Civil Revolution, Part 4. With the Enlightenment, the trust in reason began to replace Christian faith and revelation. At first, revelation was given a place in the scheme of things as necessary for things pertaining to God, which were beyond reason. As time went on, the limited realm of Christianity and revealed truth receded, and reason claimed total jurisdiction. This development had roots in Greek philosophy. For both Plato and Aristotle, theoretical thoughts belonged to the eternal realm of ideas, of form and being. The Aristotelian God was absolutely theoretical thought, the equivalent of pure form. Its absolute counterpart was the matter of principle, characterised by eternal, formless motion of becoming. The influence of such thinking has been very strong in the Christian centuries and has radically warped the Church in much of its history. If one assumes that the realm of ideas is the divine realm, then, as man becomes more rational in all his ways, he approximates the abstract and determinative realm of being. He can then become a philosopher king who brings reason and the state together to establish true justice. From the Renaissance on and again with the Enlightenment, the ideal of a philosopher king was a common one among both rulers and humanistic thinkers. It was believed that, above and over the sensory world of nature, there existed the realm of reason and freedom, so that the dialectical tension was between nature as necessity and the rule of reason as freedom. It was in terms of this that Karl Marx saw the hope of mankind in a transition from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom, that is, to the realm created by the intellectual leaders of the workers. Doivert has tellingly described the implications of this in Immanuel Kant, 1724, to 1804. Like Rousseau, Kant gave religious priority to the freedom motive of the modern personality ideal. Freedom, according to Kant, cannot be scientifically proven. For him, science is always bound to sensory experience, to natural reality as understood in the limited context of Kant's own conceptions. Freedom and autonomy of personality do not lie in sensory nature. They are practical ideas of man's reason. Their suprasensory reality remains a matter of faith. As Doivert made clear, this was no less a religion, no less a matter of faith than Christianity, while radically opposed to it. As this faith in reason developed, some nuances came to light. It was a faith closely allied to Greek evolutionary thinking. The view of the material universe, in Doevert's words, as eternal, formless motion and becoming. It is reason which gives form and direction to this becoming, as Hegel saw. Hence Hegel formulated a doctrine of cultural evolution, whereby the state becomes the central expression of reason, geist or spirit, as it realises its ideals in material form. For Hegel, according to Bussell, evolution is from unconscious reason to self-comprehending reason by the law or formula of the three stages. These three stages, as Auguste Comte later formulated them in detail, are the theological or fictitious, the metaphysical or abstract, and the scientific or positive. This is a logical development. If Hegel's Prussian state was the expression of reason, indeed its incarnation for Hegel's day, then the realised reason of that state was an unconscious reason in the eras prior to Hegel and the Prussian state. Such a perspective shifts much wisdom and reason from the conscious mind to the unconscious. In Bussell's words, 
May we not repeat with increased meaning, the Isle of Minerva takes its flight only when the shades of night are gathering. When Bustle wrote, Sigmund Freud's work had not yet gained its subsequent international prestige. It was, however, clearly in the Greek line through Kant and Hegel. For the supremacy of reason, Freud substituted the supremacy of unconscious reason. But this was not all. Without using the word infallibility, Freud saw the unconscious as infallible. In the civil realm, such thinking undergirded the irrationality of the modern state. The state was still the embodiment of reason, but it was now a developing scientific reason, a planning society instead of a planned order. Since the future required shaping in terms of the evolving, developing nature of things, this future was still a part of the unknown, an aspect of the social and scientific unconscious. In brief, we can thus say that the civil revolution has become the triumph of the unconscious. Justice no longer rules the truly modern state, but rather the development of social policy. Hence, such rational considerations as a balanced budget are disregarded. Present reality must give way to future reality, logical reason to unconscious reason. A part of this trend is the demand for charismatic political leaders who can, like Hitler and Roosevelt, appeal to men's unconscious reason. In all such thinking, the state is sovereign and it is the voice of reason. Yet that reason is unconscious and evolving. As a result, the modern state is coming closer and closer to being the expression of unreason. The ways of the modern state are increasingly past finding out. The civil revolution has thus developed into a major dilemma. It sees the state as sovereign and as reason, but that reason is now unconscious. We are left with an unconscious and nightmarish sovereign. In biblical faith, in Eleazar's words, No state, a human creation, can be sovereign. Classically, only God is sovereign and he entrusts the exercise of his sovereign powers mediated through his Torah as constitution to the people as a whole. This development of the civil revolution and its de-Christianization of the West has been due to the retreat of the church as much as the humanistic offensive. D.V. Serge has quoted Professor Nathan Rosenstrike of the Department of Philosophy in the Hebrew University as saying in 1959 that To him, the fact that it, Zionism, was given a place in the ordinary daily course of historical events meant that at this unspecified time, two or three generations ago, the fact of history ceased to be Christian history in the specific meaning of that term and became the political history of nations and of political blocks. The problem, however, is deeper than two or three generations ago. Men sought the solution to all kinds of problems outside of religion. For example, the problem of insanity was traced to mental inactivity or overactivity, and hence phrenologists argued against mental inactivity and overactivity. In other words, the issue was not moral but psychological. Popular and learned writers alike sanctified such thinking. In Cooper's very telling words, No longer was morality to be the exclusive province of theology. The laws of physiology were now to share that administration and with an even greater indisputability. Fittingly and expediently, the Reverend John Barlow incorporated this defence of morality into his Man's Power Over Himself to Prevent or Control Insanity, 1843. Quoting from Connolly that 
those who most exercise the faculties of their minds are least liable to insanity. He added that a brain strengthened by rational exercise is but little likely to be attacked by disease and thus the larger half of the evil is removed. The church was content to retreat into the quote-unquote spiritual realm or to be more accurate, into irrelevance. Authority was handed over to the sciences and the states in one area after another. At a time of declining confidence in religion and growing reverence for science, physicians quite consciously offered guidance on behavioural matters which, as one explained, the custom of centuries has wrongfully confided exclusively to the profession of theology. The Church, however, has no right to surrender what belongs to God. It has a duty to reclaim every area for Christ. Because of its dereliction, now, as always, judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? First Peter chapter 4, verse 17.